Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Intermediate Hebrew. This is week number two. Um, the notes for this class you can find at theregathering.com slash page slash PFT Hebrew 2. There will be a link there to the notes for week two, also the notes for week one, and as each week uh, goes by, there will be links to notes from each week, same thing you're holding in your hands. So, all right. So a quick review of last week. Uh, last week we talked about nouns. Okay, um, all nouns have two properties in Hebrew. All nouns have a gender. Okay, so all nouns are either masculine or feminine. If you look up a noun in a dictionary, next to a masculine noun, you will find a small zion. And next to a feminine noun, you will find a small nun. Okay, these stand for zachar and nekeva, which mean masculine and feminine. And we'll get into the function of gender a little more later on, but for now just know that every noun has a gender. It's considered either masculine or feminine. And uh, if you know certain other languages, like German has a neutral gender, but Hebrew has no neutral gender. It's one or the other. All right, and the second property that every noun has is number. Every noun is either singular or it is plural. And uh, it's a very simple, very simple concept. In English, the noun dog is singular because it represents one dog. Add an S. The S suffix dogs means more than one dog. It's plural. Okay. Hebrew does the same thing. It has a suffix indicating plurality. And, but Hebrew has a different suffix for masculine nouns than it does for feminine nouns. So for masculine nouns, the plural suffix is im. Okay, so it's unfortunate that I use dog because I'm going to use the Hebrew word dog, which does not mean a dog, but is in fact a fish. Okay, dog is a fish, it's a masculine noun, so to indicate more than one fish or fishes, add im, dagim. Okay, so dog is fish, dogim, fishes. All right, feminine nouns are indicated, uh, are made plural by the suffix ot, cholam, tav. Um, and I did not give you any, uh, in the beginner class, I didn't give any feminine nouns, but in the intermediate class, Aim is mother, to make it mothers, plural, add oat. And there is actually a, a vowel change as well, but that's not, not so important as the suffix. Mm. Yes, and the mem does change from a final mem to a regular mem, okay, because you only find a final mem when it's at the end of a word. So, so yes, this transformation does change the appearance of the mem. But yes, aim would be mother, emote, mothers. And again, you will find these vowel changes. Don't worry about them. That's a subject for another time. The suffix is the most important thing. If you say emote, it's entirely forgivable, and it's fine. <laughs> and even somebody who was speaking Hebrew would know what you were talking about. Okay. So, every noun has gender and number. Masculine nouns are made plural with im. Feminine nouns are made plural with ot. Okay, so that is a rapid, that is last week's class in 60 seconds, or however you want to, uh, however you want to phrase that. And I have notes for that if, you, if you'd like them. Um, you can find them here, or I've got them in, in uh, I think I've got them 
some physical copies. OK, so are there any questions about um, any questions about the material we covered last week? Okay. If not, I'll move on to this week's subject, or the first of this week's subjects. which is the definite article. OK, um, an article, in English, we have a word that we call the article. And this word is the word a, or an. Right? When we use this word, it, it means one. But it means one in a general sense. So a dog means one dog, but it means just a dog. It's not referring to a specific dog. It's referring to a dog in general. Okay. The word the in English is the definite article. OK, so we use this to preface something specific. All right. Now, typically, it's not enough just to add the definite article to something. Okay. If we just say the dog, that's not any more specific than saying a dog if we don't add anything afterwards to describe the dog. But if we say the dog, um, the dog that ate my homework, or um, the dog that was my sister's favorite, or um, you know, yeah, the Hebrew dog. Uh, or if we were already talking about a specific dog, and you know, later on in in the conversation, we said the dog. It's, we know we're talking about that dog. All right. So the definite article is just a fancy way of saying the word the. <laughs> okay. Um, the makes a word specific rather than general. Okay. In Hebrew. The definite article is indicated by a prefix that is attached to the noun we're making definite. So okay, for a Hebrew uh, for a Hebrew word, let's say oh, let's just use dode. I'm sure I have something else written on that paper. Okay, dode is an uncle. Okay, the prefix that is used to indicate the definite article is the letter he. Specifically a he with a patach vowel. Which is pronounced ha. Okay? So dode is an uncle. Ha dode, the uncle. Okay. So similarly. Dog is a fish. Ha dog is the fish. Okay. Now there are some rules that apply when we add a hey to the beginning of a word, indicating the definite article. One of those rules. Well, there are four. I'm going to go over two of them. 
In general, when a he indicates the definite article, it is vocalized by a patach. It has a patach vowel added to it, patach making the same sound as the comets, okay, the short a. And the letter following The letter following the definite article will take a dagish. Okay? So, dog is already spelled with a dagish in the Dalit. All that's telling us about that word is that when we add the definite article, it's going to remain. Okay. But other words don't necessarily have a dogish to begin with. So, hey with a patach and the letter following takes a dogish. Now, there are some letters that cannot take a dogish. So, If the letter following the definite article is an ayin, I'm sorry, an aleph, an ayin, or a resh, there are other letters that cannot take a dagish either, but these are the letters to which this exception applies. If the definite article immediately precedes an ayin, an aleph, I'm sorry, an aleph, an ayin, or a resh, then the letter does not take a dagish, and the vowel under the hay, instead of being a patach, is a comets. Okay? So, in the case of the word av, which means father, if we were to write the father, ha'av, aleph is the letter immediately following. It cannot take a dagish, so instead the he takes a comets. Okay. There are two other instances in which this vowel will change, but they are more complicated and involve concepts that I have not gone over yet, so I'm going to exclude them for now. Be it known, though, that you will sometimes see the definite article taking a segel vowel. Okay, I will go over those instances later. Um, but you, you will sometimes see this. It is much more rare. Uh, and the most common instance will be the patach, as you only see the comets in the case of these three letters, starting the word. Okay, so dog ha dog, av ha av. It sounds the same in the Sephardic dialect because the comets and patach in the Sephardic dialect make the same sound. Um, but it's to, so in the Sephardic dialect, it's just a matter of how you write the word, which vowel, which vowel you write, you will pronounce it identically. In either case. So, any questions about the definite article? Have in mind that the comments has a slightly longer sound than the dog. Yes, the comments is considered to be, well, the comments can be considered to be a long vowel. Um, actually, it, it's in every dialect, it, has, it can be a long vowel or a short vowel. Not, it, like, not like a versus a. Right. Right. Yeah, in the Ashkenazic, actually, it uh, makes a sound of sort of a short O. O is in pot. It's easy to see how that blends into the sound of ah, okay, because they're, they're almost identical to begin with. Um, so it's easy to see how they combined. I suspect that originally they were two different sounds, because why else would you have two different vowels if not to make two different sounds? Um, however, in the Sephardic, <laughs> they both become ah. 
So uh, it's just uh, these rules are just a matter of what you're going to write. Now, when it gets later on into grammar, it is significant which value you use, whether a comets or a patach. In fact, you're going to see the comets in general much more frequently than a patach, and it means something specific in different cases. Um, but for this rule, you're going to see a patach much more frequently. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you were raising your hand for a question. Um, So just to make sure it's totally clear, okay. dog means a fish. So to make it the fish, dogish. All right, in other words, say shame. Okay, shame is a name. To make it the name. Add a hey with a patach and put a dagish in the sheen, forming hashem, which means the name. Also used as a euphemism for God's name, hashem. Okay. Ish is a man, so to say the man, add a he, it starts with an aleph, which is one of the exceptions, so instead of using a patach and a dagish, use a comments. The man. Right. And uh, another way, some people might find this more confusing, but I think they did this on purpose. The prefix is ha with a patach and a, and a dagish has to go in the next letter. And I think the shapes of the vowels are intentional such that when you don't put the dagish in the letter, it has to go somewhere. So it goes here to make a comments. And there's actually other rules in which the same thing happens. The dogish disappears and it goes into the next vowel to make it a different vowel. So I think there's a bit of a, maybe a case of scribes having too much time on their hands to think about these things, but it's kind of a neat little thing. If you find that confusing, don't even think about it. Just remember the rule. But it's just a neat little side note. Yeah, in, in, in print, the comments frequently does kind of have more of that rounded edge as opposed to the sort of bland T that I draw. Um, but yes, I, I do believe that's intentional. Um, yeah, and there's, a, again, I, I noticed it a few weeks ago, actually. I, I started noticing rules that uh, were that doggish dot would transfer into a vowel in different cases. Like there's a vowel that's two dots side by side, the tzera, and another vowel is the segel, and there's cases where those will switch between each other depending on how the dogish is working. So I think they, I think they thought this through when they developed the vowel pointing system. I don't think they just picked random symbols. Okay, so that's the definite article. Any questions about the definite article? All right. I'd like to touch on uh, a topic that's going, that you need to know uh, for later. Okay, the definite article, the, of course, is indicated by the hey prefix. The article I mentioned before, though, a or an, is not indicated by anything in Hebrew. A or an is invisible. So there are times when you will find a sentence that to be correct in English would need to include a or an. There is no word at all in the Hebrew, okay? but it is implied. There are other invisible words as well, and some of them are much more significant than a or an. One of them is of. 
Now, in modern Hebrew, there, in fact, is a word for of in the sense of, um, you know, a man of the city or a man of God or something like that. In modern Hebrew, there is a preposition for of, but in ancient Hebrew, there is not. Okay? So, I call it an invisible word. Now, there is, there are ways to um, arrange words where the of is very strongly implied. Okay? It's called the construct state, and uh, so usually the of is very clearly indicated, even though there's not a specific word that means of. It's, it's very clear from the syntax of the sentence where the of should appear. Another very significant word, though, that is totally absent is the word is. And it's first person version am, second person version, or uh, plural version are. There is no is in Hebrew. So uh, for a sentence, you know, the dog is brown, or uh, where is he, anything of that nature, no word for is. Now there's a word for was, and there's a word for will be. The past tense and the future tense are both accounted for. But there is no is. Yes? So, so as far as an example like this screen or this, you know, computer? Um, yeah, this is using words I haven't covered yet, but... Uh, no, it's okay. It's okay. I, I can give you an example, though. Um, uh, well, this is kind of a fragment, but if I were to say, the man is here. Okay, the man, okay, Ish is man. Okay, we're adding our definite article in front of it, so Ha-Ish. The word for here is Po, not a word you need to know yet. Okay, but Po just means here. All right, if you were to translate this literally into English, you'd read the man here. Okay, but is is invisible, but it is thought to be present. Now, the man was here, you would in fact write the word for was. Okay? You'd write ha'ish ha'ya po, or ha'ya ha'ish po, because sentence, sentence structure is a little different in Hebrew than it is in English. Uh, there's a little more. Uh, more options as, as to the order of words, whereas English it's pretty, pretty set in stone <laughs> how that has to work. It's actually one reason that Hebrew has gender and English does not, because gender helps you sort through how a sentence is to be interpreted. Right. Yeah, English, um, English used to be a little different than it is now. It used to have uh, structures similar, a lot more similar to other languages and, and in fact to Hebrew. But um, we've gotten away from that and now we use word order and punctuation to, uh, to reduce ambiguity in our sentences. Hebrew does not do that. Hebrew has preferred orders but not set orders for a lot of things. And so the preferred order of a Hebrew sentence is verb, subject, object. So chased the dog, the cat. Okay, it's, it's how you would say it. You, now you could say it any number of other ways, but that's the preferred way. There are tip-offs as to what's the subject, what's the object, you know. But, there, it, but word order is not one of them. So, but anyway, um, back to this though. Yes, the present tense of to be does not exist in Hebrew. There is no word for is. Okay, so I call these invisible words because, you know, when you translate Hebrew without these words, if you don't include these words in your translation, you start talking uh, like uh, caveman talk, you know, oh, dog here, you know, but they are implied. Okay, these words are implied. So it's not not by any means incorrect to translate them. That's why you'll find in a King James so many words in italics indicating this word is not present in the original language. Now sometimes they insert like a whole phrase that's not present in the original language and those are 
a bit suspect. But when they italicize words like is or are, they're italicizing it because it's not literally present in the original language, but it has to be included in your thought of the sentence for it to make sense. Okay. Um, and to that, uh, one of the things that popped into my mind was in the King James, um, the mode of the potential variance where he said, I am. Yes, yes. That is very significant, actually. Am is not a Hebrew word. There is no word for am. Now, and in fact, in that, in Exodus 3, 3 something, um, I think it's 3.14 or 3.17, uh, where, where that phrase actually exists that's translated, I am that I am. What it literally says is, I will be what I will be. Yes, ehiya asher ehiya. I will be what I will be. It's usually translated, I am that I am. Ehiya asher ehiya. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm perhaps exaggerating a bit my pronunciation of the, the hay in the middle there. But, um, but yes, it does not say I am that I am because there, because there is no am. Now, it could say, ani, if, it were to, if it were to mean I am that I am, it would be ani asher ani. Okay, and the am would be an invisible word. Okay, I, ani means I, asher means that or which. Um, and so am would just be implied. But in fact, it says eheye, which means I will be, asher eheye, I will be what I will be. Now, the implication of that may be that he is always there. So the translators may think, well, I am is a better, better captures the idea than I will be what I will be. Because in, in English, you know, I will be what I will be, we could interpret that as being, he's not here, he's going to be there later. So perhaps, perhaps that's the motivation for the I am that I am. I think another reason they do it that way is to try to attach it to uh, the Greek word ego imi, because Yeshua, you know, in the New Testament, Yeshua uses the word ego imi to say I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. Um, so yeah, the Greek word, right, anochi would be the Hebrew, which was what he would actually have said, in my opinion, <clears throat> and a lot of scholars' opinions. But um, but yeah, so so I think there's I think the I am in Exodus three is an attempt to link that to the places where ego emi appears in the New Testament, but I don't think it's a valid link because it, it literally says I will be what I will be. So, um, but anyway, that's just an aside. Um, I don't necessarily hold it against them for doing that because the idea of existence in general is what's being communicated even in God's name. Um, but literally, it is, does not mean I am that I am. So, yes, that's a very, very significant <laughs> thing about that. Um, but anyway, you'll find many Hebrew sentences uh, that, in which these words are implied, but they're lacking because there are no words for these words. Okay, so as we move along, we're going to start constructing some sentences, and uh, if you don't know that these words are invisible, those sentences aren't going to make very much sense. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just be aware there are words that we have in English that are implied in Hebrew but not written, not spoken. And another subject I'll touch on is um, irregular plural forms. Excuse me. Um, as I mentioned before, the plural ending for masculine nouns is im. Echirik, yod, mem. And the plural ending for feminine nouns is ot. Kolam, tav. There are cases where there are exceptions, and these are irregular plural forms. And so as we go, when we encounter words that have these irregularities, I'll point them out. Um, 
99% of the time these rules are going to be followed, but there are some words that are very common that are in fact exceptions. So one of the most significant is the word av, which means father. We would expect the plural form of this to be avim, since av is a masculine noun. But in fact, the plural of father is avot, fathers. Okay. So there are these irregular forms. Um, there's also another kind of irregularity in plural forms, which is that the spelling of the word will actually change. So the Hebrew word for daughter is bot. Okay, bot is a daughter. It's a feminine noun, as we would expect. To make it plural, we would expect that we simply add cholam tav to make it batot. But this is an irregular plural form. And the thing that happens to this word is that this tav disappears and the word becomes banot, daughters, okay? So just be aware that there are these irregularities. They're not common, that's why they're irregular. Um, but they will happen as we encounter words that uh, have these features. I'll go over them. I don't want to cover a bunch of them right now because you're trying to remember em and ot right now. <laughs> um, but these do exist.